And welcome to another exciting edition of Geometry. We are now in Unit 2. We've just completed Unit 1. And so our first lesson in Unit 2 is none other than Activity 9 or Lesson 9-1, Transformations. Now, unfortunately, we're not talking about those awesome Transformer movies. Uh, where a car turns into a fighting robot. Uh, but we are looking at transformations of figures on the coordinate plane. You see these three words at the top, translation, reflection, rotation. If you recall, hopefully from middle school, uh, most often covered in middle school geometry, a translation, another word for that is a slide. Another word for reflection is a flip, and another word for rotation is a turn. So if you see one of those three words in our text, our, we're going to elevate our vocabulary a little bit. We're going to start using terms like translation, reflection, or rotation. Uh, but before we get too far, let's take a look at our learning targets. We will perform transformations on and off the coordinate plane. So we're going to stick to the coordinate plane here at the beginning, observe some transformations, but we're also going to hang out off the coordinate plane and observe what really is going on with these transformations separate from the coordinate plane and see how uh, the characteristics are the same. We're also going to identify characteristics of transformations that are rigid motions and characteristics of transformations that are non-rigid motions. Hopefully you can guess that those are the exact opposite of each other. Whatever a rigid motion is, we'll see what it is. Non-rigid is the exact opposite. We will also represent a transformation as a function, that F word you should have used a lot in Algebra 1, not the other F word you're thinking of right now. But we're going to represent transformations as functions using coordinates and show how a figure is transformed by a function. So there's our three learning targets. Don't forget to rank them. Just depending on your first um, understanding as you read them, maybe you're kind of familiar with transformations. So rank them and then let's get started into our lesson 9-1. Mr. Scott directs the Marching Cougars, the band at Chavez High School. He uses the coordinate plane to represent the football field. For the band's first show, he arranges the band in a rectangle that is six marchers wide and nine marchers deep. So each of these dots here on the coordinate plane that make up this rectangle represent marchers in this band. So the band begins by marching down the grid in this formation. Then the marchers move apart from each other vertically while keeping the same distance between marchers within the same row. The diagrams on the next page show the initial shape of the marchers and the two, here's our first vocab word, transformation. So let's take a look at the math terms. A transformation is a change in the position, size, or shape of a figure. So hopefully you're thinking of all the transformations you learned in middle school, and that's what we're seeing here. To describe and classify the transformations, you will compare what's known as the pre-image of a transformation to its image. So let's look at those vocabulary words over here. The pre-image of the transformation is the original figure, and the image is the figure after the transformation. So without further ado, if you would draw a line under number one, take a second, compare the images that you see here, and answer item one for playing through the video. So we were asked to use our own words to describe transformation one. So our pre-image here is in figure A, uh, where our marching band is set up. And then after our first transformation, our image in figure B, we see that they have moved down the field, or in this case, the coordinate plane. If this marcher was originally at 110, now they are at 1-4, so I said that it was a slide down six units. Now, let's take a look. If you would, just like the last one, draw a line under number two. 
and then answer item two before playing through the video. So obviously you don't have to use my words, but hopefully it's in the same, uh, same vein here. So I said that transformation one preserved the formation, you know, that it's a band formation or the shape. Um, notice that they just slid down the field, but if we go back and look at it, transformation two from transformation one to two, we see that the players or the, the marchers start to move further away. So I said that the transformation two, the formation link lengthened vertically, the, the marching band got further away vertically. You notice I use the word here, preserve. Take a look at our math term. A rigid motion is a transformation that preserves size and shape. There's one of the vocab words we saw on the previous page. So a rigid motion is a transformation. So we have a transformation. All of these are transformations that we're gonna learn about in this lesson. And a transformation can either be a rigid motion, which we see the definition here, or a non-rigid motion. So we're seeing the definition of a rigid motion is a transformation that preserves size and shape. So let's take a look at three. If you would, draw a line under 3B. Take a second, complete items 3A and B before resuming the video. So A, how does transformation one affect the distance between any two marches in the band? Well, I use that term from our vocabulary, the distance is preserved. So transformation one, like it says here in our text, is an example of a rigid motion because the distance between any of the marchers is preserved. How does transformation two affect the distance? Well, the distance is preserved horizontally. Notice the marchers didn't, didn't get further apart horizontally on the x-axis, but they did move further apart vertically. So I said, therefore, it is not a rigid motion. Well, hopefully you're gathering. Well, transformation two is an example of a non-rigid motion because the size and shape was not preserved after the transformation. So we're starting to see the characteristics of a rigid motion and a non-rigid motion. If you would now, go and draw a line at the very bottom of the page and complete item four, A, B, and C, before playing through. Okay, so item four tells us we're, we're focusing on transformation one. It says each point in the pre-image is mapped. Mapped is a new word. It doesn't literally mean like a map that you typically see in geography. It literally be, means being moved to a new location. So the pre-image, every point is mapped to a point in the image. For this reason, the transformation can be expressed as a function. So I just kind of wanted to review what a function was from algebra one. You saw something like this, f of x, which means the function of x. For example, a pretty basic function is x plus 2. So you created a table, and on the left side, we have our values of x, our input, and then on the right side, we have our f of x, our output. So if I plug in 1 for x up here in this function, 1 plus 2 is 3. That's its output. Likewise, if I plug in 2 for x in this function, 2 plus 2 is 4. So this side is an input, this side is an output, but this is called a function. And that's because every point or every value for x is mapped or creates a new point, f of x, or y typically is how you graphed it last year. So A, complete the table to show the positions of the four corners of the rectangle with figure A is mapped onto figure B, literally moved to that new location. So the four corners were 1, 10, 1, 2, 6, 10, and 6, 2. 110 moved to 14, 1, 2 moved to 1, negative 4, 610 moved to 64, and 62 moved to 6, negative 4. So then in item B, you're supposed to look at the function and kind of start seeing what's happening to these x coordinates and to these y coordinates. How does the transformation change the x coordinate and y coordinate? Well, I said the x coordinate remains the same. Look, figure A, this coordinate was 1. This coordinate is 1. And likewise, for all of these coordinates, the x-coordinate does not change. But the y-coordinate, if you go back and look at the numbers, how do we go from 10 to 4? Well, we subtract 6. How do we go from 2 to negative 4? We subtract 6. Each point does the same thing. That's why it's called a function. Now, think about what I said here. Subtract 6. When we talk about subtracting 6 
On the Y coordinate, we're talking about moving down the coordinate plane. That's why you see from figure A to figure B after the first transformation, we saw it move down the coordinate plane. That's why we said the Y coordinate is subtracting six. Now item C, we kind of start to see how the notation looks for a function of transformations. So it says you can use the notation 110 and this little arrow, that little arrow literally means goes to. That's how we're gonna read it. So that point, 110 on our previous page, that point went to 14, it moved. So to show how a point is transformed, when you use this notation to show how a general point is transformed, you are expressing the transformation as a function. Notice, and I realize that reading in math, that, that error means goes to. So what did all of these points do? Well, all of the X coordinates remain the same, but the Y coordinates, we subtracted six every single time. That's why it slid down the coordinate plane. So our function will be X, Y goes to X because it, because it remained the same, Y minus six. So if I give you any coordinate that underwent that transformation, you can plug it into this function and find its new location after the transformation. That's transformation one. Now let's turn the page and take a look at transformation two. So draw a line underneath 5C and then work through transformation two before continuing the video. So hopefully you're starting to get the hang of this. So it says complete the table to show the positions of the four corners of the rectangle when figure B is mapped onto figure C after the second transformation. So we see that one four on the pre-image went to one eight on the image. One negative four went to one negative eight, six four to six eight, six negative four to six negative eight. And item B says, how does the transformation change the X coordinate and the Y coordinate? And so it's gotta follow the same pattern. That's the focus here. It's gotta follow the same pattern. That's what makes it a function. So some of you are wondering, okay, I see that the X coordinate remains the same, but something's going on with the Y coordinate. Well, if you go back and look at the actual transformation, we said that it lengthened vertically. It literally got twice as large vertically. So that's how I figured out what's going on with our X and Y coordinate. Well, our X coordinate remained the same, but for, in order for it to be a function, the Y coordinate has to do the same thing each time. So four go to eight. Well, yeah, you could say add four, but that wouldn't work for negative four to negative eight. If I add four to negative four, I get zero. So that couldn't be the function here. Sure, it works here again. For add four, we get eight. But then again here, negative four plus four is not negative eight. So in order for it to be a function, they have to do the same thing. So that's why they ask in item C, can transformation two also be expressed as a function? It actually can. Explain why or why not. That's because all of these coordinates are doing the same thing. The X coordinates are remaining the same, but the Y coordinate is being multiplied by two. That's why we said it lengthened vertically. The Y coordinate um, is being multiplied by two, lengthening it vertically. So here is the function. Every point X, Y goes to X remains the same, and we double Y. Last thing we're gonna look at together uh, before you look at the check your understanding and the lesson practice. If you would go and draw a line at the very bottom of our page and complete six and seven before playing through the video. Okay, so let's take a look at item six. Hopefully you pause the video to take care of it. Um, just to explain a couple things, I tried to use some color coding here so you can see where those points ended up. And then in gray, I, I wanted to show you where it was um, originally, the pre-image before the transformation. Um, for those that need a little assistance, maybe you're not understanding how to use this function appropriately. It says X, Y goes to X plus three, Y. That tells us that we are going to move to the right three units because on the X axis, adding three is moving to the right three units. And then our Y coordinate's gonna stay the same. Well, I set up a function table like you're familiar with or hopefully familiar with where every point here is what we're gonna, our input, and here is our output, where the point goes to. So if you need to use a table like this, go for it. I'm not necessarily requiring it, but if it's hard for you to understand that this means move to the right three and don't move up or down at all, 
go for it. Now, if you notice, the size and shape of this square is preserved after we use this transformation function. So this one is referred to as a rigid motion. Conversely, or the opposite of that, let's look at B. Every point goes to 2x, 2y, and just like transformation 2 above, we saw that multiplying any of our coordinates times a number other than 1 is going to be uh, a non-rigid motion. It's going to change the size of our figure. And likewise, what I did here is I created a function table with our inputs, all of the four corners, and our outputs after we multiply by 2. And again, I did the pre-image in gray just so you can see it on one coordinate plane. You don't necessarily have to do that. But notice what is happening here. When we use this function, not only is the size and shape changing, but it's also moving away from a key point. In fact, that point is the origin. I just want to point that out here. Oh, um, also, if you don't know this, the point zero, 00 on the coordinate plane is known as the origin. The origin. So I really want to point that out as we progress in this, these lessons. Not only is the size and shape changing, but also this figure is kind of moving away from the origin. And we're going to see why that is a little later on. The last thing they wanted you to do was write the Roman numeral 4, or the numeral 4, excuse me, in the middle of each pre-image in item 6 and describe how the numeral should appear in each image. So this is a pretty unique idea here. They just want you to see how the figure changes. Well, in item six, if you six A, excuse me, if you drew the Roman or the numeral four in the pre-image, it should look identical in the image. All they're hoping you to see is that the size and shape is preserved after using this transformation function. But then in item B, if you drew the numeral four in this pre-image, it should literally look twice as large in this image because this is a representation of a non-rigid motion because the size and shape is not preserved. So hopefully we're seeing how to use these functions, how to write these functions, and start discovering the difference, the characteristics between rigid and non-rigid motions. As always, at the end of our lesson, go back and rank the learning targets, see if your understanding changed. There is also a check your understanding that is really good. Really, it's just more practice for you, so feel free to take care of that before you even complete the lesson practice on the next page. So that's it for lesson 9-1. Watch it, re-watch it, do what you need to. I will also tell you at the very end of this lesson, there's a couple keywords here on this math tip, so be sure to check it out. And thanks for watching lesson 9-1.